email, so I'm just uh, describing it anyhow. Um, okay. Um, so let's start talking about uh, continuing where we were on ordinal logistic regression. Okay. Now, just to remind you, uh, for most of the class last time, we talked about polytomous logistic regression. And both polytomous and ordinal logistic regression involve a logistic model where you're dealing with an outcome that has three or more categories three or more categories of the outcome. And when you're dealing with um, polytomous logistic regression, the categories aren't ordered. So um, when you're using polytomous logistic regression, you're going to get as many odds ratio as one less than number of categories. Well, odds ratios is you have one less than number of categories. There's usually a reference group. You have to decide on a a reference group, and then you'll get an odds ratio that compares each category, each of the other categories to the reference group. And so if there are, if there are five categories, you'll get four odds ratios. And we looked at what the model looked like. Uh, we looked at uh, the general formula for the model. We looked at some examples. We looked at the odds ratio formula, and we looked at some examples where it was calculated uh, or the computer did it. We showed how the computer program works or uh, how proc logistic works. And the key thing with, with proc logistic, if you want to use polytomous logistic regression, is what you have to do is you have to add this G logit, link equal G logit. To the, um, to the code in order to make sure that the computer does polytomous logistic regression. Uh, and it turns out we'll talk now about ordinal logistic regression, continue a little bit from where we left last time, and uh, I'll show you what the code is there and what the output looks like. Okay? Any questions? Questions at this point? Okay. So, um, the example I've been ta I started talking about uh, was this example dealing with um, again this word that I can't pronounce very well. I keep trying, asinodibacta, asino, asin, as, see, asinidobacter. Did I do okay on that after ten tries? Asinidobacter bacteria and it's resistant to asinidobacter. Okay, that's the outcome. And um, uh, actually, that's not the outcome. The outcome was three categories of the length of stay that a person was in the hospital. Okay, and the key, and it was a, if you remember, it was a retrospective cohort study that involved matching. Okay, but it wasn't a matched case control study. Okay, it's co cohort study that involved matching. The exposure variable was whether or not a person was either resistant or susceptible to this uh, bacteria that I can't pronounce. Okay, so um, uh, so th this exposure variable is called AC status. So AC, okay, as opposed to DC. AC status, okay, and um, and the outcome is. Ordinal hospital days in, uh, in length of stay in three categories. Okay, and then there were some other variables. Well, first of all, there was this matching variable. People were the the susceptibles were matched to the resistant um, ex persons uh, cases on how long they were in the hospital prior to their getting infection. Uh, as, as long as they were within, were within 5% of the number of days that they were in the hospital, they were considered to sort of be at risk for the same, roughly around the same amount of time. So there was this exposure variable, exposure time variable that was the matching variable, okay? And that variable was defined um, uh, if th there were 3,000 people in the, in the study. Well, actually, 3,000 people in the study originally, no, no, wrong study. As you can see, there are 120 people, 112 people in the site, I can't even read, 112 people in this data set, okay? Uh, and um, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, there wasn't, um, it wasn't pair matching, 
Um, and in fact, matching was was the was pooled into groups, into eight groups, and that allowed us to avoid uh, allowed the analysis to avoid having to use um, a conditional maximum likelihood approach, which wasn't available for the ordinal logistic regression approach that's in proc logistics. So that's why there were eight. Um, uh, Ex not eight exposure time categories that allowed us to get around having to uh, do uh, something that we couldn't do, which would have been um, using conditional logistic regression and allowed us to do unconditional logistic regression. Then there were two other variables called Apache and Charlson that were other control variables. So these three variables, new X time, eight categories, this Apache variable and the Charleston variable, which were both continuous variables, were control variables. And the exposure variable was AC status, and the outcome was length of stay. And we started looking at this table. That's what we were looking at, which is a three by two table that describes the relationship, the crude relationship between exposure and disease. Doesn't control for the other variables. Okay, that's what we started looking at. And um, what we then did when, with this table was I showed you in the second slide here, this next slide, where I formed from this three by two table two two by two tables. I sort of cut the three by two, I cut the pie into two sub pies, you might say, or two, two pieces of the pie that uh, uh, both of which involved the same number of subjects, but in order to uh, do this, uh, the first piece was I, I combined the, the, the two and the one rows into a single row, so 24 and 16 were 40, and 13 and 23 were 36, compared that to the last row, to the, to the reference group. And then to get the second table, I uh, combined the, um, the first, the zero and one groups and left the second group. So I have these two tables, okay? And, one, and I, I think I mentioned a table that I didn't do. There was one other table I could have done. I didn't, I mean, I combined one and two versus zero and zero, one versus two, but I didn't combine zero and two versus one. I didn't, I could have done that. But I didn't do it, and the reason why I didn't do it is because if I did, I'd be breaking up the ordering, zero, one, two, three. This way I'm keeping the order. One, two versus zero, or zero, one versus two, is still comp comparing two groups where it's keeping the order. But, but looking at zero and two versus one is breaking up the order, and that would be in, incorrect in terms of the, the way one would do this, uh, set up the crude analysis. Now, for each of these tables, we're right near where we ended last time, that for each of these tables, you can get a, it's a two by two table, so you can get an odds ratio. And for this table, the odds ratio was one point, for the first one, it was 1.39, for the second one was 2.48, okay? And uh, what I say over here on the right-hand side is what um, these two odds ratios you would expect them to be approximately the same if you if you uh, wanted if you were going to be able to use this approach called the proportional odds approach to do ordinal logistic regression. That's the approach that I'm going to describe. There are some other approaches I mentioned, but this is the only approach that uh, proc logistic allows you to use the proportional odds approach. There are some other approaches. In fact, another approach you could use if um, uh, if you decided that um, none of the other uh, approaches for dealing with ordinal uh, outcomes, uh, an ordinal outcome work, which they use polytomous logistic regression. But if you use polytomous logistic regression, when you really had an ordinal outcome and you had an ordinal approach that did it, you're, you might be losing something. You're, not, uh, you're losing some efficiency, not taking into account the fact that there is some ordinal, there's, there's, there's this ordering in the, in the outcome that maybe will make your odds ratios and your tests and your confidence in a little more efficient. So um, in any case, we look at these two numbers, and th these two should be approximately equal, and they're not. They look very different, okay, as we said last time. And as, re as a result, this suggests that if you took this data and just did the crude analysis, 
it wouldn't be appropriate to use the proportional odds assumption. That's what this suggests. Okay. Okay. Now, as it turns out, this is the crude, again, what I'm showing you is the crude data. Okay. I'm not controlling for the other variables, the three other variables that we wanted to control, that the investigator wanted to control for. So if you really wanted to assess whether the proportional odds model was appropriate, what you'd want to do is to, is to do an analysis, even if you're going to split up the pie into subtables, you'd want to split up the pie to take into account the variables you want to control for, not just doing the crude thing. And if you did that, it may turn out that the tables that you get when you split things up could be a lot more tables. Okay, but it may turn out that when you start looking at the odds ratios you get in those tables, it may turn out that they actually are equal. The ones that you need to compare are equal. And so it may turn out that when you consider what they wanted to consider, the variables they wanted to control for, maybe the proportional odds uh, assumption is okay, even though it doesn't look okay here. And as it turns out, as I'll show you very shortly, when you do this way of considering the other variables, the ones you want to control for, it is satisfied. The proportional odds assumption is satisfied. And the way you actually do this is not by doing a more complicated split up according to the variables. There's a test for this. It's called the test or the score test for the proportional odds assumption. So you do this test and you do this test. If you've got other variables you want to control for, you put into this test some information that reflects the other variables, not just the exposure variable and the, disease, and, the, and the health outcome. And that test may turn out to be not significant, even though when you did the crude analysis, the test might be significant or these two odds ratios, as you can see, are very different. I don't know if you got what I said. Well, just to, just to make it clear how things might work nicer, here's another table. And I said a hypothetical example. This isn't the data. I made up some data. Okay. So here's a different table that maybe they, they didn't get this table, I just made up this table, okay? Okay, now if you look at this table, it's got 275 people in total, whereas the previous one had 112, but I'm just making up some numbers. If you took this table and you split it up into the two sub-tables that I did before by combining things the same way, 30 and 20 or 50, 30 and 70 or 100 versus 25 and 100. I'm doing the same thing, but now I have a different set of data. If I do that and compute those two odds ratios, what do you notice? They're very close, 2 and 2.06. So this is the kind of situation that if you got it and you were only looking at the crude data, this would be the kind of situation where you would expect to see the proportional odds assumption satisfied. This is a good situation for using that model. Whereas this one isn't, except that the, the, you could criticize making the decision that you can't use the proportionalized model. You can criticize it because you haven't controlled for anything. You haven't controlled for anything either, but at least this looks pretty good. Okay, so that's the hypothetical example. Now, let's talk about this test, the score test. Okay. And that's built in to when you run proc logistic to do ordinal logistic regression using this proportional odds model, that test result automatically comes out. You automatically get that in the output. Okay. So you can look at that result. And it's a chi-square statistic. So I'm not going to talk all about the theory, but it's a, oh, a chi-square statistic that's approximately chi-square. It's assumed that with a reasonable uh, data set, large enough data set, it's approximately chi-square. And the degrees of freedom is given by this expression, S times K minus 2, where S is the number of predictive variables in the model, and K is the number of ordinal categories of the outcome variable. Okay. Now let's go back to this. Okay. So what's K? Is that what I said? K? K. The number of ordinal categories. How many ordinal categories are there? Three, right? So go back to this thing. K minus two is one, right? So what's S, the number of predictive variables? Well, if you're just using the crude data, crude data, whether you're using the hypothetical example, example or the real example, then just the crude data, there's only one variable in there. And it's a binary exposure variable. So S is equal to 1, right? 
So, so what, what's the degrees of freedom? One times one, so that's a chi-square with one degree of freedom. So if you're going to do this test with the crude data, you get a chi-square with one degree of freedom. Okay. Now, if you're going to do this, so, so as I say, for the ordinal 3 by 2 table, in table C, table C is this hypothetical example. See, I say it's table C, and then I form table D, these two subtables from it. Um, the score test is equivalent to testing the null hypothesis that the two odds ratios are being estimated by collapsing one or more of the rows of the table, is that these two odds ratios are equal. Null hypothesis is that the proportional odds assumption is satisfied, or alternatively, if you're just using the crude, uh, table, the crude data, and that's all, and you're not considering anything you want to control, and you're not controlling for anything, then another way to state the assumption is that these two odds ratios are equal. That's the null hypothesis. So then you use the program or you use the, whatever the formula is, which the program does, and you compute this chi-square, and it turns out the chi-square for the hypothetical data, the value is 0.0082 and the p-value is 0.9281, which says what? Very non-significant, okay? So if I was using this data, the wrong data, you know, the data that doesn't, I don't have, but I made it up, so that if I use this data, and all I have is the crude data, this would be fine. That's if that's all I wanted to use. If I wanted to use the, um, the real data, and I wanted to use that test, I wouldn't get this value. In fact, I don't think I actually ever computed it. I might have computed it, um, somewhere and put it in one of the one of the chapters. I mentioned that there were two I, I think I mentioned that that there were two resources, two chapters that I've written related to uh, polynomous and ordinal logistic or well, particularly for ordinal logistic regression. There's a chapter on ordinal logistic regression in your logistic regression model book, the text for this course, one of the two texts for this course. And there's also a chapter on combining pol polynomous and ordinal into one chapter in the other book, the regression text that you had last spring with Bob Lyles. And in that text, um, this, the, this example uh, and including the hypothetical example are described in there. So there's a, um, uh, so the slides that I'm showing you with this example and even with the example I used for the um, polynomous come from the, uh, the other text, the uh, Kleinbaum, Cooper, Nizam, and Rosenberg text. But anyhow, um, so it turns out that if I use the score test for the AC data, uh, AC data, S is now not, is not one, because I've got more than one variable in there. Okay, in fact, if I look at the variables that I'm considering, I have, this is one, I have this variable nu x time, which was a variable that had eight categories. So I have seven dummy variables, right, for the eight categories. So there's seven variables for that variable, seven, one, or eight, this is one, there are seven variables for this one, and then there's these two other variables that are in the model too no interaction model. So S is equal to 10. S is equal to 10 in this case. So I'll go back to this. S is 10. K is still 3. Okay. So the chi-square test, the degrees of freedom for the test, if I actually want to consider the variables I'm controlling for, all the variables in the model, it's going to be chi-square with 10 degrees of freedom. So when I get look at the output for um, the proportional odds model for the real data, it's got to be tested. The, the, the proportional odds score test is going to have a 10 degree of freedom. It turns out that, um, this is it, there it is. Turns out that the chi square happens to be, turns out when I run the model, I'm just showing you it, is 8.7459, the degrees of freedom is 10. And if you go to tables of chi square, and you look up to see the p-value, this is the p-value. Highly non-significant. The null hypothesis is that the proportional odds assumption is satisfied. That's the null hypothesis. This says you don't have evidence to reject the null hypothesis. So if you do the score test and it's non-significant, 
you have support for doing ordinal logistic regression using this model. And that's what this says. Okay? So even though the two unadjusted odds ratios shown in the, in the table that I originally showed you are different, we can nevertheless justify from the score test that the proportional odds assumption is satisfied for these data if you want to use these other variables, we want to control for these other variables. Okay, that's what I've done so far. Now, uh, let's go a little further. Uh, now, the next thing I want to show you is what the proportional odds model looks like. And this is what the formula looks like if you're just dealing with the crude data, where you only have one, one predictive variable, one exposed, you're not controlling for anything else. This is what the formula looks like for the proportional odds model, model that is assuming that um, uh, something about, well, we have to explain this, we have to explain what we mean by proportional, but this is what the model looks like. Now, what's different about, well, what's similar to this to the original binary, the original binary logistic regression model, the right-hand side is similar to the binary logistic regression model, isn't it? Isn't it similar? It's 1 over 1 plus e to the minus something, right? That's what the formula for binary logistic regression. However, it differs. It differs because the intercept has a subscript. Whereas when you're doing binary logistic regression, it's just alpha, right? It's not alpha sub g, okay? And the g has to do with the number of categories you're talking about, the number of ca ordinal categories you have. And the g is the g category, is what it stands for, okay? Now, the, so, you know, this is similar, this formula is similar, but it's not exactly the same. So that's one of the differences. Now, the, the other difference is on the left side, right? It doesn't say probability D. Remember when it was binary? It was probability that the, the, the outcome was equal to what? What was it for the binary one? Probably that D was equal to 1. You either had a 1 or a 0. And now it's got something different. It's a probability that D is greater than or equal to G, where G takes on the value either 1 or 2. It takes on these two values, 1 and 2. In fact, in our example, the the um, uh, the uh, AC example. There were three categories of exposure, and they were coded as zero, one, two. Okay, zero, one, two. That's the three categories. Okay. So if you look at this formula, okay. Now if if we're talking about the probability that D is greater than or equal to 1, there's only two possibilities, one, greater than or equal to 1. What are we talking about? There's three categories, 0, 1, 2. So if D is greater than or equal to 1, what are we talking about? Could be 1 or 2, right? Can't be 0, right? Now, what if instead the G was equal to 2? If D was greater than or equal to 2, what category or categories are we talking about? Only the, the last one, category two. So when G is equal to one, we're talking about one and two. And when, when G is equal to two, when G is equal to two, we're just talking about two. Okay. So, um, so that's something that explains, you know, that says it's different. This is one of the things that's different. And then another thing that's different is that since you now have more than one alpha in the formula, it turns out there's a relationship between these alphas. And alpha 1 turns out to be, in this formula, is greater than alpha 2. Now, the, I'll, I'm going to explain that with, an, with a little math, with a little algebra, to explain why that works. But, but in, a, in a sense, it something has to work. Some, there has to be something to reflect the ordering in there, and that this is where the ordering comes in. This is something that the ordering comes in in the alphas in this in this formula. We'll, we'll talk about. It. We'll, we'll illustrate this. But another thing to point out about this formula is, if is you notice, look at the formula, the expression for the coefficient of the exposure variable. Okay. If you look at that expression of the coefficient of the exposure variable, what you don't see that you saw in the polytomous logistic regression model, you don't see a subscript G for the beta term. This is beta, not beta sub G. Okay? 
There's no subscript. There is a G subscript for alpha, but not for the beta. Okay. Now, I don't know if you remember this, because we only did it two days ago, but you know, maybe you're up to speed on this thing. But when you did ordinal logistic regression, well, we talk, uh, polytomous logistic regression, remember you got more than one odds ratio. You had for each category, you had an odds ratio that compared with the reference group, right? So you had an odds ratio for two versus zero and one versus zero, okay? So you got two odds ratios if you had three categories. How many odds ratios are you getting here? It's getting one. It's getting one odds ratio. Now, one issue is, what is that odds? What does it mean? So we need to talk about that a little bit. But when you do ordinal logistic regression, you're not comparing two versus zero and one versus zero. You're getting a single odds ratio that doesn't, that doesn't compare something to a reference group. To a reference group. Okay, so we've got to talk about what that means. Okay. So, um, so that's what I say. The coefficients of the predictive variables, the predictive variables, only one here, are not subscripted, subscripted by G. So any odds ratio for this model, in this case, this odds ratio, doesn't depend upon G. Okay. That's another way of saying, but we'll see it more explicitly, what we mean by the proportional odds assumption. The, the proportional odds assumption is, another, is one way of saying that when you use this model, you're, not, you're only going to get one odds ratio or a single odds ratio for any expression that you want to have about the exposure variables of interest. You're not going to get several odds ratios. And as I said, g equal to 1, 2 corresponds to the two 2 by 2 tables that can be formed from the crude 3 by 2 table for these data that we did by splitting up the pi. That's why g is g 1 and 2 has to do with the, this way of splitting things up that we did over here or over, or over here. Two, there are two tables like this. Okay, now, okay, now, here's some computer code. Next thing. Well, I mean, one thing you want to know is, this is a little tricky, getting used to this model, but let's look at the code. How do you do this if you had the data? Okay. Now, this is a way to write the code for the data that I have. Because the data, and, and I'm actually what this says here, this is for table C, that's the hypothetical data. Okay. Now, um, you notice that I just have, um, how many lines do I have? It says data simp input, and then I got cards, or I could have said cards, to, we used to have cards, and now you put in, uh, what do you put in? Data lines, okay. And then there are six data lines. This is the first one, this is the second one, the third one, if I mean, I could have put this on the next line. Six data lines, six data lines. Now you remember the table for the table C? Table C had six values in there. So I'm putting in a table line for each of the six values in this table, the 20, 30, 30, 20, 30, 30, 70, 25, 100. And those are the six values, 30, 70, 120, 30, those are the six numbers. So what are these other numbers? The two and the zero and the one and the zero? That's distinguishing from the table whether somebody was either had the health outcome or they had the D was equal to zero or one or two or whether they were exposed or unexposed. So this is, these six lines are describing all the data in that three by two table, and the way it's doing that is the very first line of this is counting the number of people in that particular cell. In other words, there are six cells, there are six cells, and there's 20 people in this cell. There's 30 people in this cell. So each of the numbers, 20, 30, 30, 70, 20, is, is sort of a frequency count. So. And I think um, at some point when Eli was, re was reviewing logistic regression, there's a way you could set this thing up where you have a frequency count. So the, all the data is described in here. And then it says input FRDE. FR stands for frequency. The frequency variable is the variable that describes the 30, 70, 120, 30, 25. The D is 2, 1, 0, and the E is a 0, 1 variable. Okay? You put the data in. You then say run. And then you write the code for running the model. So this is the key part. This is just putting in the data. Key part says, 
proclogistic descending, just like we one way of doing it, descending, to make sure that the outcome is not the, not the zero, but the higher number. Data, SI, that's the name of the data set, SIMP, simple data set. Model D equal to E, what does that say? The outcome variable is the D variable. The predictive variable is only one, and that's the exposure variable. And then by putting in the FR freak FR, I'm telling the computer that I have 70 people like this, or 30 people like this. So I'm counting the, pe I'm counting the people. And then I say run. Now, one of the things you may notice about this code, and I'll show you the code soon for the real data set with, with the variables we're controlling for, but one of the things you may notice about the different, differing from the polytomous logistic regression approach is that when we did polytomous, what did we have to add? G logit. Do you see that here? No. So when you're running proc logistic to do ordinal logistic regression, there's no G logit statement. In fact, if you run this, there's no G logit statement. It looks like what you're writing here is what you would normally write if you were just doing binary logistic regression. I mean, you just, you know, you're doing binary, it looks like you're writing binary, just doing a binary logistic regression, except you have some frequency, you're counting the frequency in the cells, and instead of having four cells, you have six cells. Okay. So how does the computer know when it sees this, and it doesn't see geologic, that it knows it's got to do ordinal logistic regression, which is the other option, instead of binary logistic regression? How does it know that? The outcome has more than two. Yeah. Who said that? Daniel. Okay. Yeah, because there's more than two categories. So the computer is automatically going to do ordinal logistic regression if it turns out when it looks at, in some theoretical way, conceptual way, when it looks at the outcome variable and sees that the outcome variable has, is not just a zero one variable, it has three categories, or more than three categories, it's going to automatically do ordinal logistic regression. So when it doesn't have G-logit and you've got more than two categories, it'll do this polynomist uh, um, proportional odds ordinal logistic regression approach. Okay, so that's the code for that. In fact, if you run the, this code for this hypothetical data, for the hypothetical data, you run this code, you get this information that I've got on the screen. Okay, look at the top, top of the screen. You see that? What does that say? Score test. So you get the score test right away. And this is the data that I only showed you, crude data. I didn't really have any other variables I was controlling for. Okay. And for this, these are the numbers I showed you. The chi-square is 0.0082, and the, uh, the p-value was 0.9281, highly non-significant. Okay. So that, that's, you know, it's, this, this table C, the hypothetical data, satisfies the proportional odds assumption. There's no other variables we're controlling for. Now, notice the output over here. Notice the output. What's different about this output, different from the polytomous output? Well, you see two intercepts. Well, you know you're going to get two intercepts, because you, you've got alpha sub g. But how many coefficients do you have, how many estimated coefficients do you have for the exposure variable? One, because that's what the model says. You don't have a different, co you don't have a different coefficient depending upon g doesn't depend upon G. So you only get one of these, okay? And then what either, either I think it automatically prints this out if you just write the code that I showed you, and I didn't even write the uh, RL for risk limits or getting the confidence, but it automatically gives you this, odds ratio estimates, okay? And look, it says E, because that's the only variable in this model. So you're only gonna get an, you're not gonna get an odds ratio estimate for the intercept. You're just gonna get it for E, because the intercept, you're not interested in that. And you notice it says 2.023. So what's that? Well, that's e to the 0.7044, right? e to the beta. So the formula for the odds ratio in this model is e to the beta. That's the formula for it. Just like you would do e to the beta in a binary logistic regression model. It's the same formula. Okay. So what is this? 2.023. What is it the odds ratio of? 
Okay? It's an odds ratio. It's an odds ratio for the effect of exposure on the outcome, given that you're doing ordinal logistic regression using the proportional odds model. Is it significant? Well, yeah. Or yeah, right? It's significant. If you look at the confidence interval or the, the wall test for it, you could even do a likelihood ratio. If you wanted to do a likelihood ratio test for it, how would you do that? How would you do the likelihood ratio test? Well, you'd fit a model where you drop E. You just have the two intercepts. And you get a, a log likelihood statistic for the model that only has the intercepts. And subtract the two, and it would be degrees of freedom what? What would be the degrees of freedom? Not two, it would be one, because there's only one variable you're dropping. You're not dropping, there's only one coefficient you're dropping. So you can do a likelihood ratio. The wall test is significant. Uh, you know, I didn't do the likely ratio test, but I've given you one of the two log likelihood statistics. Are, are you following me here? I, I hope you are. It's, this is not that, you know, but I'm not sure. Maybe I'm just talking to myself, you know. So now, let's say a little bit about the 2.023. Okay, this is important to say. You see these two numbers uh, here, 2.2.00 and 2.06. See those two numbers? And then the number I just showed you from the apple was 2.03. What do you notice about that number? It's between those two, right? Two point, what is it? Was it 2.03? Is that what it was? I keep going back and forth. Two point, oh, sorry. Um, 2.023, 2.02. It's between those two numbers that you got for when you cut the pie in those two ways. So what is the what are you getting when you do ordinal logistic regression? You're getting the average, some weighted average of the two odds ratios you can get when you cut the pie in a number of different ways. And no matter how you cut the pie, you basically each way is giving you the same odds ratio. That's what's being assumed. Doesn't matter how you cut the pie, that's where the ordinal as long as you keep the order, the ordinality when you cut the pie, you're getting the same odds ratio. And that odds ratio you're going to get is an average of whatever odds ratios you get. That's what it means. Okay? One, a single odds ratio that allows for the ordinality. So that's what you're doing. Huh? Well, that's what it is. Now let's, now let's go a little further. Go a little further here. Look at this. This is the code for the, um, the, the AC data. Ah, right? Code for the AC data. Proc logistic descending data equal to AC, AC in the B class. Now, you see this variable new X time? I've defined it as a class variable. What does that mean? Again, that means the computer is going to define dummy variables from that. And then this is a variable with eight categories. So when you put it in the model like this, it's going to be seven dummy variables, right? That's what it's going to do. It also has the variable Apache and Charleston. They're being controlled for these other variables. And it's got the exposure variable in here. So that's how you run this. Okay? And you notice you don't see G loads it. Why don't you see G loads it? Because you're not doing polynomial logistics. You're doing, uh, you, you're doing uh, the proportional odds model using ordinal, an ordinal logistic regression approach. How does it know to do ordinal logistic regression? Because there are three categories, not two. So the computer, just like Daniel said, is more than two categories. So there you go, Daniel. Now you're in trouble. I'm going to call on you every time. No, not necessarily. Yeah, OK. So OK. See, you pay for it. Pay for being good. You know, I don't know. OK. So, um, so Again, I showed you the model, I showed you the formula for the model when there was only one exposure variable, okay? For the, um, the model, the data set where there was just doing the crude data, three by two. But this is the general formula for the proportional odds model. How have I changed things? Oh, well, it's a little bit more complicated. The left side is the same, right? Probability y equal to greater than g. Okay, given x. X is the number of predictors, the, the collection of predictors that, you're on, that are on the right-hand side. 
Okay? You see the alpha sub G over here, right? Same thing as before, because he's got as many subscripts as you have uh, one less the number of different um, uh, categories. Still one less the number of different categories. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you've got regression coefficients times a bunch of predictive variables. But what you may notice, you see it says beta j over here. But you don't see a little subscript G. It doesn't say beta J G. So there's only one coefficient for each different predictive variable. It's what this says. And that's what the ordinal logistic, ordinal logistic regression model does. And now, because you have G categories, and therefore G goes from 1 to G minus 1, you have more than two alphas, and each one of these alphas, alpha 1 to alpha 2 to alpha G, you know, one, the first alpha is larger than the second, lar large and so on, so, and so on. So that's the general formula for it, okay? And it just allows you to say, and you know that the key thing about this is that there's no G subscript on any of these regression coefficients. So if you're going to get an odds ratio for any one of these predict, let's say one of these is exposure and the others are variables you're controlling for, then it's going to be a single odds ratio. You're not going to get several odds ratios that you would get if it was polynomous. Okay. So um, in fact, here you go. Um, this is the model. I'm just doing it again, showing it again. This is the proportional odds model, how it would look for the AC study. Okay. It's 1 over 1 plus e to the minus alpha sub g, and it's got those AC status, Apache, Charleston, and those seven dummy variables. That's what this model, that's what it translates, it translates to for the data set that we're doing the analysis on. Okay? And you notice, for example, the AC status variable just has a single coefficient. So for this model, which is a no-interaction model, right? It's a no-interaction model because you don't see anything exposure times a control variable. So what's the formula for the odds ratio for the effect of AC status? It's e to the beta 1. So you fit this model and you, you, get, e, you get beta 1 hat and you exponentiate it. If you want to test a hypothesis for it, you do a wall test or a likelihood ratio test. You want to get a confidence interval, you get the usual confidence interval form for it. And it's not that much different than binary logistic regression in the sense how you deal with it because you're only getting an e to the beta type of answer to this. Okay? And now, but e to the beta in this case is an average of the different odds ratios you get if you took the pi and you cut it up in different ways that you're allowed to cut it up and you control for the other variables that you're putting in the model. That's what this is. Okay? Now, I want to explain something else here. Why are the alphas, why is alpha 1 greater than alpha 2 greater than alpha g minus? There's a little algebra you can do to prove this, just to show you that you can do this. Okay? So first of all, this is when you're talking about the probability of y is greater than or equal to g, you can write that, that the probability of y is equal to g, plus the probability of the y is equal to g plus 1, plus probability and so on, until you get y plus the probability of the y equals up to capital G minus 1. So it's the sum of all these things, starting with G, because that's the lower bound of this expression. Okay. Now, if you're talking about, that's in general, but if you're talking about what's the probability that Y is greater than, equal, greater than equal to 1, then you start with 1, then you go to 2, and you go up to G minus 1. When you start with probability Y greater than or equal to 2, you're starting with 2, not with 1. Okay. Now, and when you go up to, um, uh, let's, so, so uh, well, as you can see, as you can see from this, there are more terms here than there are here, right? So this has got a, this term is, is in this formula, but it's not in this formula. So this thing has to be larger than that, right? Big deal, right? The, probably Y greater than has to be larger than, big deal. You know, so now, now what that means, and I haven't proved about the alphas because it's a little tricky. Okay, now what it means is that if you look at the expression for what the formula is, I've now written if 
the probability of y greater than 1 is greater than the probability of the probability of y is greater than or equal to 2. I can take this expression, put in alpha equal alpha sub 1, and I can put alpha sub 2. This has got to be greater than that. It's got to be greater than alpha 3. This follows because of what I've just written here. Okay. Well, does that prove that alpha 1 is greater than alpha 2? No, because there's more algebra to do. Okay. And I'm just going through the gory details of the algebra. Okay. Now I'm just now focusing on the first and the second alphas. So what I've just shown here is that this one's greater than that. So I just wrote it up here again. This one's greater than that. Well, if this is greater than that, then what, I've, what the next line's got to be true also. What have I done with the next line? I've inverted this. This is 1 over something, and this is 1 over something. And I just say, I just sort of looked at the denominators. You know, if 1 over this denominator is greater than 1 over that denominator, and I just look at the denominators, then this denominator has to be greater than that denominator. You know, you have to switch the 2 with the 1. That's just algebra, okay, which you knew before you got into the MPH program. Hmm? Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Huh. Well. And then you go on. Well, you look at this thing. If this is true, okay, then this next statement has to be true, right? Because the only difference between what's here and what's here is there's a one here and there's a one here. It's the same one. So this has to be true, okay? Well, if that's true, and the only difference between what's here and here is this extra term to same extra term. So I can write e to the minus alpha over 2 is greater than e to the minus alpha over 1. Alpha sub 1. That's just algebra. Okay? And if that's true, e to the minus something is greater than e to the minus that, then I could, I, this is like 1 over e to the alpha sub 2, and that's 1 over e to the alpha sub 1, and I could rewrite that and say, well, then e to the alpha sub 1 has to be greater than e to the alpha sub 2, and therefore alpha 1 has to be greater than alpha 2. Big deal. Okay? So that's why the alphas follow. You know, if you never really thought of that. That's how it follows. You never have to do this again. Maybe. And I'm just showing you that. Okay, now, it's another thing I want to show you here. Okay. Now, the model, remember, the formula for the model, this was the formula. This was the formula I showed you down here at the bottom of this screen. Right? Probably y greater than or equal to g is 1 over 1 plus e to the minus, this thing, where there's the alpha sub g, but there's no g's here. Okay. Well, there's an equivalent way I can write this model, an equivalent way. It's a logit formula. Remember when we talked about the logistic model? There was a way to write the probability formula, and there was a logit way to write the model. And there were two equivalent ways of saying the same thing. Well, this is the logit formula of the model. Now, think about this. Is this a log? Is this is a log of something over something? Okay. When you're talking about a log, the log of an odds. What's an odds? A p divided by one minus p. Right. That's what an odds is. A p over one. Now, is the denominator one minus the numerator? As they say in Georgia, show enough. <laughs> right. Yes. Right. If probably if y is greater than or equal to g, the opposite of that is y is less than g. So this is an odds. This is a log odds. And if you take the log odds, if you actually if you take the odds, if this is the odds and the log odds is equal to that, it just follows, then the odds is equal to this. That's what the odds is. Okay? The wizard of odds. Okay, so that's another way, another way you can write the formula. You can write it in the log. So you can either do it this way, or you can do it, you remember when you did logit, when you're doing uh, for binary logistic regression, you just had the linear part of the model. Well, that, that comes out when you write the logit form of the proportional odds model. Okay, so, so there's two ways to write it. Now, um, this uh, is not that important, what's on this slide. It turns out that when you're running, we're all using SAS, right? 
But some of us like other programs. Does somebody like other programs? What other programs do you like? Well, there's another one called STATA. There's another one called R. There's another one called SPSS. There's other different programs. If you use STATA, they use a different form of the model. And it's a little tricky, but I'm just saying that. I don't, I don't really, I'm not going to go further with this because we're going to emphasize thing, uh, emphasize SAS in here, even though if you're using STATA, you have got to be a little careful. The model's a little different, and the alpha sub G's in the STATA model is minus the alpha sub G's in the, other, in the, in the SAS model, but the betas are the same. Anyhow. Now, here's what I want to talk about. This relates to the proportional odds assumption. Okay. Now, this expression, this over this is the odds. The odds for y being greater than g is probability that y is greater than g over 1 minus the probability that y is greater than or equal to g, which is probably y is less than g. Okay? And that's equal to this. I've just showed you that. Just showed you that on the previous slide. Just showed you that on that slide. So if that's true, if that's true, and this is the odds, this is the odds, okay? Now, suppose we talk about an odds ratio. Not an odds, an odds ratio. This is a formula for the odds for an individual who has a certain set of values of the predictors. Now, suppose we have two individuals, just like when we talked about an odds ratio when we're doing binary logistic regression. Suppose you have two individuals, an individual X star and an individual X. And this is the formula for an odds for any one individual, but we want to look at the odds for these two individuals, we want to get the ratio of those two odds. So the, if we're comparing x star with x, then the odds for the individual for x star divided by the odds for individual, that's just writing that. The odds for one person divided by the odds for the other person. Well, what is the, what's the formula for each of these two odds? Well, here's the formula for the x star person, and here's the formula for the x person. All I've done is taken this and put it in it, but I've taken an, I put an x star in here because that's x star person. The x's might be different, okay? And that's the x person. So if I do a little algebra here, what do you notice about what when you do the algebra and you get this expression? What's not in this expression? Alpha, the alpha is not in there, and there are several alphas, but they drop out, right? That's what you get. You get an expression for the odds ratio that doesn't depend upon the G. You get an odds ratio expression that's independent of how you've cut the pie. Doesn't matter how you've cut the pie, how you've split up the big table into subtables, even though there's a number of different ways you could, you could do it. So the odds ratio comparing two different covariate vectors, x star and x, x star and x, is independent of the category of g. Now, where does the proportional odds, where does that term come from? Well, you go to the next slide. Well, it's true that the ratio of the odds, odds for one person divided by the odds for the other person, is equal to a value that has nothing to do with g. It only depends upon the two x's of these two individuals. Nothing to do with G. So if you take, if you say, well, if A over B equals C, then A equals to B times C. You know, that's just a little algebra too. So the odds for X star is equal to this number, some value that has nothing to do with G, times the odds for individual X. Well, that's a way of saying that you can get one odds for one person from the other odds by multiplying it by some number that only depends upon the two people but doesn't depend upon how you've cut the pie. That's why it's called proportional. This odds is proportional to that odds because you can get one from the other and not worry about how you've cut the pie. That's what this says. That's what the proportional odds assumption says. Another way of saying it is that when you get an odds ratio when you're doing uh, when you're doing polytomous logistic, uh, ordinal logistic regression, it's not going to depend upon G. That's another way of saying the proportional odds, what, the, what that means. It doesn't depend upon G, the way you, the way you can split up your, your categories into different ways. One versus the others, or one and two versus the others, or, or so, so on. 
Uh, so that's what the proportional odds assumption is. Now, let's see if there's anything. Okay, so here's the, let's look at the, the data and the result for the data. Okay, so here's the, uh, by the way, how are we doing with this? We, okay, uh, am I doing all right with this? I mean, you following this? Should I have gone faster? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Should I go slower? Well, can't go any slower because we'll never get out of here. Okay, so here's the model again. I've shown you this model, okay? The model has several different alphas, but it only has a beta for each different variable. So I run this model, and this is what I get. This is the output when I run the model using proc logistic, using the coding. This is what I get. Now, what do you notice about this? I get two coefficients for the intercept, right? Two different intercepts I'm, I'm getting, okay? How many coefficients do I get for act AC status? One. How many do do for every other variable in the model? One. Because those variables, the predictive variables, don't have a subscript. Okay. Now, why did I put AC status in bold? Because that's the exposure variable and it's a no interaction model. Right? So, for this model, if I wanted to get the odds ratio for the AC stat for the exposure, well, how do I do it? What do I do? I exponentiate this, and it controls for everything else in the model, right? And that's what's on the next slide. The next slide has the AC status e to the beta. It's 1.987. And it's e to the beta for all these others, but we don't care about these other e to the betas. We only care about this 1.9. I should have only had this one in bold. I shouldn't have had the others in bold, okay? 1.987, that's the confidence limit. You can also... Can you see from this of the wall test? Is it significant? Is the wall test significant? Well, not at the 5% level. It's a two-tailed test, okay? Two-tailed test is, is not significant. What about the one-tailed test? How do you do a one, what if you wanted to do a one-tailed test for this? Would it be significant? How do you do a one-tailed test when you, from a two-tailed? What do you do with the p-value? You multiply it by two, or you divide by two. Divide by two is the two is the one tail test going to be significant? Yeah. So maybe you have something, depending on how what you want. Whether it's one tail, how do you decide whether it's a one tailed or a two tailed? Do you try decide based on whether you get the result you want to get? No. Okay. Good. Thank you. I won't say any more than that. Okay. So okay. And you notice that the 95% um, the conf confidence interval is wide and includes the no value, but the lower limit is 0 0.930, which is pretty close to 1. So it's sort of borderline significant. You can say, well, you know it's borderline significant, but this is the wall test. Maybe the likelihood ratio test might actually be significant. But anyhow, that's what you get. And you can say, well, it looks like maybe when you control for all these other variables, um, uh, people who are resistant are more likely to, um, uh, well, no, what's, what's the outcome? The outcome are more likely to have a longer stay in the hospital. That's what you're, that's what you're worried about. I mean, the outcome is, you're saying, if you're resistant, are you more likely to stay in the, in the, in the hospital than if you're not resistant? That was the question. Okay. You've always got to go back to the question. I mean, you can get lost in all the stuff we're doing, but that's, that was the question. It looks like there is, there is a moderate effect here. Uh, I mean, the t this is almost two. It's borderline significant, um, not significant with the confidence interval. Um, significant if you take a one, if you do a one, um, a one-sided test. So that's how you do it. Okay, and and that's that's well. I, I'm not even going to talk about this because mainly um, I wanted to talk about how you, how you do it. So that's ordinal logistic regression. Okay, so. With that, now, what I want to do is now, I, what I also did is I, I changed the last couple of slides to try to help explain some things a little bit more. Now, what I'm now going to show you in these next few minutes is just sort of a summary of what we've just done this class and the last class, a summary of polynomials and ordinal, just writing what, what we're talking about, uh, more or less, okay? So suppose you have a situation where You've got, and it's a summary, but in a, in a simple way, you've got three categories of the outcome, and you've got a binary exposure variable, and suppose you have three variables that you want to control for. 
And they're all, you know, age, race, and sex, and there's no subcategories. You don't have eight categories of, um, of matching variable, whatever, or, or eight categories of some other variable. You just have three variables, and let's say they're all binary. So here's a model. And I said polytomous. Can you tell that this is polytomous? How do you know that this is polytomous? Well, one way to know is you see you got a G on every coefficient in the model. Right? See that. And you notice the model is the log of P of Y equals to G compared to y, uh, P of Y equals zero. So you're comparing one category to a reference group. Okay? So in this case, G is one, two, so it's two versus zero and one versus zero. So that's a polytomous logistic regression model. And if you wanted to test, just to review what you have to do, if you want to, this is a model that has, you see it has some interaction terms products of E with C's, right? So this is, a, this is an interaction polytomous logistic. So if you wanted a test for the interaction in this model, you'd be testing whether the coefficients of these interaction terms are equal to zero, right? How many terms do you have? Do you have three? You have six. Why do you have six? See, it says... Delta J G, okay, and G goes from one to two. So there's three deltas for each of the different G categories that you're comparing to the reference group. So there's six deltas. So the null hypothesis to test for interaction is that all six deltas, I wrote delta G, J, G, J goes from one to three, G goes from one to two, it's a chi-square with six degrees of freedom. So if you're doing a test for interaction here, it'd be a six degree of freedom chi-square test. Okay. And, the, the, and if you're doing the likelihood ratio test, the full model is this. And what's the reduced model? Same old stuff. What's the reduced model? It doesn't have these terms in here, these product terms for both versions of the model. For per, you know, this way of writing it has two components to it because G is one and two. Remember I said you got as many components as you one less the number of uh, categories. So this model for the, for the reduced model won't have these different product terms. Okay? And so it's again, it's the, the likelihood ratio test would be the, the minus two log Maximum likelihood for the reduced, minus minus two log, maximum likelihood for the full, it's chi score six degree of freedom. Now, what I added to this is that if this test was not significant, this wasn't in the original thing, if this test was not significant, this model would reduce to this model, right? Because I'm dropping the product terms. Just want to make sure you know that. And for this model, the formula for the odds ratio for the effect of exposure for the effect of exposure, it would be this. So you'd get several odds ratios. You wouldn't get a single odds ratio because you've got three categories. So you're comparing one category to the referent and the other category to the referent. So you're going to get two odds ratios. So that's the formula, e to the beta sub g. That's when it's polytomous. Okay. What about this next slide? Now this is an ordinal logistic regression model. Right? Well, one way you know it's ordinal is you look at the right-hand side, and even though you see a G here, you don't see any Gs here. Right? It's one way to tell. But the other thing, the other way you have to tell is, well, what's this left-hand side? What's this? This is the log what? This is one way to write the model. This is the logit form of that model. The logit is linear if you're using proportional odds. I could have written it as a probability y greater than g, then it would be 1 over 1 plus e to the minus, but I've written it in a way that the right-hand side is linear. And again, this has interaction terms. That's the ordinal just proportional odds model. That's the formula for it. And it turns out for this model, here's the formula for the odds ratio because it has interaction terms in there. It involves the coefficient of the exposure variable and the coefficient of any product terms that involve exposure, just like it did when it was binary logistic regression. This is the same formula that we use for binary logistic regression because you don't have to worry about the alphas here when we're getting an odds ratio. Okay, So that's ordinal logistic regression. 
you want to test for interaction, you're testing whether these terms then drop out, testing whether you can get rid of these three terms. So the null hypothesis, now you only have three deltas, you don't have six deltas. Okay, so you're testing whether delta 1 equal delta 2, delta 3, 0. And the full model is this model. The reduced model, uh, the reduced model doesn't have this, these product terms in there. And, um, and it's a chi-square test with three degrees of freedom. Reduced minus the full chi-square with three degrees of freedom. And if it turns out that test was not significant, this model would reduce to this model. There's no product terms in this model. And for this model, the formula for the odds ratio for the effective exposure is just e to the beta, like it would be in binary logistic regression, except you're doing something extra because you have an outcome that's ordinal. So you're making more use of that in doing this analysis. So that's what ordinal logistic regression is and how it compare, differs from polynomials. It's, it's the same as binary, only a little different. You know, you just have to get used to these little differences here. But it's not that bad, okay? When you look, when you see the practice exams, you're going to see the practice exam focuses primarily on either uh, polynomous or ordinal and asks a whole bunch of questions on it. It doesn't do a binary logistic regression model. I mean, that's a whole hat now, in some sense. So the practice exams and your midterm is going to focus more on these two because if we're really doing the same thing, it's just a little bit... Another level, another slight level up. Now, one last thing. One last thing. Now, look at, this is, this is the last thing. I may have some other things to say, but this is the last thing I want to say about this issue, what I'm doing here. Okay. Now, again, what, this is the formula for the ordinal, an ordinal logistic regression model, and this is the logit formula, right? The logit formula. And this is the formula for the log odds. It's not the formula for the log odds ratio. It's the formula for the log odds. So there's odds and there's odds ratio. An odds ratio is the ratio of odds. The odds is something for an individual person. There's an odds for one person and there's an odds for another person. So what if I actually wanted to do the, what if I asked, if this was the model and I asked what's the odds that y is greater than or equal to 1. What's the odds for a person that, for any person, x, that y is greater than or equal to 1? And then I'm asking, what's the odds for that same person that y is greater than or equal to 2? Well, if I did, I'd write the odds for y greater than 1 like this. If I write it for y greater than, I'd write it like this. These are the two formulas that I get for y greater than or equal to 1, y greater than or equal to 2. Now, you remember I said the odds ratio doesn't depend on how you cut the pie. But what about the odds? If I'm comparing for the same person, two different odds, same person, person X, not, there's no X star here. Looking at person X, I'm comparing the odds for Y greater than one versus the, the odds for Y greater. Which one of these, are they the same? Why aren't they the same? Because this has got alpha one and this has got alpha two. Which one is larger? This one, because alpha 1 is greater than alpha 2. We already went through that. Okay? So if you're comparing odds instead of odds ratios, you can talk about for a given person, one odds is different from another. If you're dividing one odds for from, 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 from one person with the same odds for another person, uh, uh, then you could be talking about an odds ratio that won't depend upon the alpha. But when you're talking about odds, you do get something. So there's going to be something, you, when you look at the practice exam and you look at the, and you actually get the exam, there's going to be a question like this about odds to ask you some question, question related to this, to this formula. So that's pretty much now, if I click on the next slide, what happens? Okay. So I've just finished with that. Okay. Now, it's quarter after five. Okay. Should we stop? That's what I figured. <laughs> Have you had enough? Okay. So let's let me let, but before we stop, let me just say, before we stop, let me say, what have we done? What have we done up to this? We've done polynomous and ordinal logistic regression. Okay, right? That's what we've done in the last two classes.
Prior to that, we did modeling strategy. Well, really, it applies also to polytomous and ordinal. You can still talk about how do you get the right model, even if it's a polytomous or ordinal. So we've done modeling strategy, and we talked about modeling strategy for a nice, simple situation. We had a single E and no interaction. We talked about modeling strategy for a single E, and there was interaction. And then we started talking about modeling strategy for several E's, okay, which got more complicated. Okay. So on Tuesday, I'm going to say a little bit more about that and kind of review some of the things that we've said. I and mean, one of the things that was a little complicated was what happens if the model that you get at the, at the end of everything only involves E's, like you have two E's in there or three E's, and you want to come up with the best model? How do you do that? Well, that was talked about in the lab, but it's still a little bit something you ought to we talk about a little bit more. Right? What do you do? And there's a lot of options. And no option is necessarily better. You know, no, none is exactly always right. There's different ways to do it. So I'll talk about that a little more on Tuesday. And the other thing I'm going to talk about on Tuesday is something that's not going to be covered on the exam. And that's what the next, next topic is. It has to do with collinearity. Okay? And that's an important topic. And that topic is going to be on the following exam. So if you come to class and I finish talking about the strategy review, and then when I start talking about it, everybody has a mass exit, exodus, you know. Well, I can't stop that, but it's on the next exam, so it's up to you. So, you know. And again, of course, we're recording this, so do you have to come to this class? It's on recorded. Well, it's probably a good idea to come to class and then listen to the recording, because then you hear it again, and you can stop it and play it back, but everybody's different. So you go for it any way you want to, okay? See you on Tuesday. And you got stuff to do this weekend, don't you? I thought so. Sorry, but that's life in graduate school, right? Okay. This is Megan. No, this is not Megan? It is Megan. That's who I saw before. Okay. Question. Let me just do something before you ask your question so I can 